ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادلهم بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو اعلم بالمهتدين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters in Islam, welcome to another hadith discussion and which today we are discussing and reviewing and summarizing and doing some brief commentary on the book Hidden Defects in Prophetic Narrations and we left off talking about some of the causes that lead to a hadith having hidden defects in them and we talked briefly yesterday about two of those causes or and they are basically related to one cause which is not knowing the narrator's names or mixing the names of the narrators up and this is related to four categories which they call al muttafiq and al muftariq and al mu'talif and al mukhtalif so yesterday we went over al muttafiq and al muftariq and today we're going to go over al mu'talif and al mukhtalif so this category is referring to the names that their gentilix or written form is the same but they are different in their pronunciation this is one of the most difficult and precise disciplines that the student of hadith needs to master in this science of hadith and specifically related to Ar-Rijal, related to the narrators. Many useful and beneficial books have been written by many scholars of the past, such as Al-Azdi, Imam Ad-Dar Qutni, Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, Imam al-Zahabi, Imam Ibn Hajar, Al-Asqalani, and many, many others so preciseness and accuracy of this branch of hadith sciences the mu'talif and the mukhtalif is only attained through constant training constant review and through mastery and in some of our previous discussions we showed some examples of some of the names which are written the same but they're pronounced differently and that's why it is very important that the student of knowledge always sits with the shiuch in person and benefits from the verbal instruction of the teacher so that they may be reading something in a book but the teacher will clarify it for them how the name is pronounced how the word is pronounced similarly with the memorization of quran it's very important that you learn the quran from a qualified teacher who is going to focus on tajweed first and foremost and make sure that the student pronounces all of the letters correctly then all of the letters with the harakat with the tanmeen with the dhamma the kasra the fatha the sukun the shadda and the likes so let's take a look at some examples of al-mu'talif and al-mukhtalif so we can get a clearer picture as to what we are talking about 
So if you see here in this document I prepared, so an example of Al-Mu'talaf and Al-Mukhtalaf are, you might find that the names may be written, there, but they're pronounced differently. Or the Al-Qab. Okay, the Al-Qab. I guess you can say nicknames of the narrators. And then the kunyas can also be mixed up. For example, you have Abu Hamza and Abu Jamra. Okay. And the nisab. Sometimes the family names. The family names can be mixed up as well, such as a Shaybani or a Saybani or a Zubaydi or a Zaydi or a Rabadi. Okay. So here, when we take a look, we find that without the tashkil, without the fatha and the kasra, and without the dhamma, the fatha and the sukun, both of them would be the same. The only way you would know how to pronounce them properly is if they had the harakat on them, or you heard your teacher relaying them to you. So this one, Salim and Sulaim. This one, Salam and Salam. You see, just the difference here of a shadda. That's it. Here, Yasar or Bashar. And many times in the old manuscripts, you would not be able to distinguish sometimes between a sheen or a seen or a ya and a ba. Sometimes one nukta, one dot would look like two, and sometimes two would look like one. So you would find that sometimes some of the narrators would get mixed up between the two. Here's another one, Hizam and Haram, which are also two names. Okay, The only difference here is the Nukta on the, the Zai. Right here. Here you have three, Bishrun, Busrun, and Bishirun. Okay, Sometimes... You find in some of the older manuscripts that some of the scholars would not write the ya. Sometimes maybe they would just put a fatha upon the ba and you would understand that it is bashir without them putting the two nuktas under the ya for the ya. Here's another one. Yazid wa bureid. See, if we were to remove all of these nukat, the two nukat under the ya, the one above the zai, the two under the ya here, the one, the one nukta under the ba and the two under the ya, it would look the same. They would all look the same. So the only thing differentiating here is the tashkir, right? And you have a dot here on this za, you have one dot under here under the ba and two under here under the ya. Here we have al qab, al qab that also looks similar as well. Al bazaz, who sold fabric or cloth. And al-bazaar, al-bazaz and bazaar. The only thing that is different here is the nukta here on the zai, as there is not one here on the ra. So bazaz and bazaar. Here, same thing. Al-hamad and al-jamad. Okay, the only thing difference here between the two is the nukta under the jim, under the jim. So. The scholars of Hadith, they authored books which they differentiated between these different types of names, these different types of al-qab, these different types of kunyas, these different types of uh, nisab, so that when the student of Hadith and when the narrator of Hadith and when the, the scholar goes in and dives into the books of Hadith, that he doesn't get some of the names mixed up. Then this takes us on to the next category, al-mutashabih, al-mutashabih. And one of the masters of hadith from the 4th century, al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, he also had a book concerning this science as well. And some examples of al-mutashabih, are, for example, Musa, the name Musa ibn Ali, and Musa ibn Ulayya. So you see, 
Musa ibn Ali and Musa ibn Ulayya. The difference is just the harakah. Another example is Muhammad ibn Hunayn and Muhammad ibn Jubair. Another example, Mu'arraf ibn Wasil and Mutarraf ibn Wasil. And Ahmed ibn al Hussein and Ahad ibn al Hussein. So those are Mutashabi, where their, their first names are very similar, and the only difference is one letter, similar to the previous category. Then we also have another category which are called Al Mutashabi al Maqloob. Al Mutashabih Al Makhloub, which the names resemble each other, but now they are turned around or flipped upside down. Where one name, for example, I'll give you an example, is Yazid ibn al Aswad, okay, who was a companion. Yazid ibn al Aswad. And there's a tabi by the name of Al Aswad ibn Yazid. Yazid ibn Aswad, who was a companion, and Al Aswad ibn Yazid, who was a tabi'i. Also, we have another example of Al Mutashabih Al Maqloob is Al Walid ibn Muslim, who was a tabi'i from Basra, and Muslim ibn Al Walid, Al Madani, Al Damishqi. So you see how the names got flipped upside down? So Yazid ibn Aswad was the name of the companion, and Al Aswad ibn Yazid was the name of a tabi. And from the amazing things that Arama Hurmazi, one of the first ones to actually author in the sciences of Mustalah Hadith uh, from the, the third century after the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One of the things he mentions in his book in Al Muhaddith Al Fasil is that there are numerous narrators with the kunya of Abu Salih from the Tabi'een. And they all narrate hadith from Abu Huraira. So this is also important for the student of hadith to know. You have those whose names are Abu Salih from the Tabi'een who narrate from Abu Huraira. You have Abu Salih as Samman. You have Abu Salih, Mawla Uthman, Abu Salih al-Ash'ari, Abu Salih al-Hanafi, Abu Salih al-Khuzai, or al-Khuzai, or al-Khizzi, okay, and others. And when they are mentioned in the chains of narration, many times they are only mentioned with their kunyas. And in this case, it becomes very hard for the student of hadith to determine who that narrator is exactly unless they refer back to these books which clarified who they were and they know where the chains of narration are where the majority of the narrators of the chains of narration or that chain of narration that they're dealing where they are from exactly is it a medini chain where all the narrators are in medina and from medina is it a kufi chain where all the chain all the narrators in the chain are from kufa is it a chain which is all the narrators are from Basra and the likes. So that's one of the causes that caused some narrators to narrate mistakenly and causes of hidden defects which were later discovered later on um, by some of the great imams. Another cause, another cause which leads to hidden defects is when some of the chains of narration resemble each other and one is not able to memorize or narrate it without making mistakes in it. So what will happen is sometimes one may add an additional narrator in the chain or omit a narrator or mix up the chains of narration and ascribe it to another text. So you may have one chain of narration with the text that goes with it, but Sometimes a narrator would mix up that chain of narration and put it and annex it with another text. And this is the reason why many of the scholars of Hadith would test their students as well as their teachers by intentionally mixing up the chains of narration and ascribing them to other texts. 
as occurred with uh, Thabit, Al-Bunani, Muhammad ibn Ajlan, Abban ibn Abi Ayyash, Al-Hasan ibn Sufyan, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Abu Naim, Al-Fadl ibn Dukain, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al-Darqutni, al-Uqayli, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhli, and many others, many others. And subhanAllah, I recall one of the famous stories that Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani mentions in Hadi al-Sari, in his muqaddimah, in his introduction to Fath al-Bari, is what occurred with Imam Bukhari that proves Imam Bukhari's extraordinary memory, his accuracy, and his preciseness. On one occasion when Imam Bukhari was in Baghdad, they all heard before Imam Bukhari reached Baghdad that he was coming to sit with some of the scholars of Baghdad. And when the shiyukh of Baghdad learned that Imam Bukhari was on his way and due to arrive there any day, the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith of Baghdad, decided to test him. They were going to test Imam Bukhari. They heard so much about Bukhari, and they said, well, now he's coming to Baghdad. Let's test him to see if he really is the Amir al mukminin fil hadith and Sayyid al muhaddithin So what these scholars of Baghdad did, they wanted to test him, test his memory, test his, his, his awareness. So those scholars, those muhaddithin of Baghdad, they wanted to test him by changing the text and chains of transmission of 100 hadith. So what did they do? They joined the chains of one hadith. They, they joined one chain of one hadith with the text of another and attached the chain of this hadith with the text of the prior. So like this, they mixed up the text and chains of transmission of 100 hadith. So they took 100 chains of transmission with their hadith and then mixed them up. And then every scholar took a bunch of hadith. And then when Imam al-Bukhari arrived to Baghdad, the people held a gathering in his honor in which most of the ulama, the common people, the public, the nobles, they were all present. So one person stood up according to the plan and asked a question regarding a hadith with its altered chain of transmission. He asked Imam Bukhari about this hadith, which the scholars, they took the chains and put them with other texts, other mutun. And then... <laughs> After that, a second person stood up and recited in a similar manner, like this. And it continued on until they completed 100 ahadith and they awaited Imam al-Bukhari's reply. So then Imam Bukhari, he looked around and he saw that everyone had finished asking their questions. He stood up. And described the chain of transmission of the first hadith read. And then gave its correct chain. So imagine Imam Bukhari. He memorized all of those hadith which were presented to him. In order. With their chains mixed up and arranged with other mutun. And then he recited them back in that same order. He said well as for the hadith you mentioned with this chain then the correct chain of transmission and the correct metan, the text that goes with it, is this one. And as for the second hadith, the third hadith, the fourth hadith, all the way up until he had given the correct chains of transmission to every hadith. When Imam Bukhari was finished, the entire audience was praising him and they recognized the superiority and greatness of Imam Al-Bukhari Subhanallah And in another version of this story It mentions That 400 Hadithin Have gathered in the city of Samarqand To test Imam Bukhari 
They did this by mixing up the transmissions, the routes of transmission, the chains of Syria with the chains from Iraq and the chains of Iraq with the chains of Syria. Similarly, they inserted the chains of Mecca into the ones of Yemen and vice versa. And they did this to Imam Bukhari for seven days, but they could not mislead him in text or the chains of narration not one single time. He had comprehensive knowledge in the science of hadith. All of the routes of hadith were in his eyes, in the pupil of his eyes, and in his brain, and in his heart. So Imam Bukhari had a good view of all of them. In that age, no one had more command over the different routes of transmission than Imam al-Bukhari. So we find here that it was normal for the students to ask questions to the teacher to test their memory, to test their preciseness and accuracy. And also sometimes the teachers would ask the students questions to see how they're progressing, to see how sharp they are intellectually, how precise they are in narrating, how can they distinguish between the different names in the chains and they don't get them mixed up. What is their level of understanding? And even one of the great scholars of hadith Shaba ibn al-Hajjaj also used this technique to test a narrator's level of memorization and preciseness if the person agreed with him in the chain of narration that he changed then he would know that he had not memorized it and his memorization was weak but if he disagreed with him then he knew that he had memorized it and another example is what Ibn Abi Hatim mentioned in his Al-Ilal when he asked his father about the hadith that Ibn Abi Zaida narrates from Ash'ath, from Muhammad, from Abi Salama, from Abu Huraira, from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who said the people of Yemen have come, faith is Yemeni. So Abu Hatim, he said, this is a mistake. This is how Masruq ibn al-Marzuban narrated it from ibn Abi Zaida, which is a mistake. Rather, it is Ash'ath from Muhammad ibn Sirin from Abu Huraira, from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And Muhammad ibn Amr narrated it from Abu Salama from Abu Huraira. He mixed up one hadith with another hadith. So these are some of the examples of how many of the scholars of Ilal, of Ahl hadith of the past, those who had extensive and extensive knowledge and mastery over the sciences of hadith were able to um, distinguish between the correct chains, the incorrect chains, and point out small mistakes when sometimes the narrators would mix up some of the chains with other texts. Another cause, which is a cause for hidden defects, is the narrator not being precise or accurate in his narrations for a particular reason. We mentioned this in some of our previous discussions. Um, one's memorization changing, changing because of old age, um, maybe health factors, someone becomes blind or somebody is too young they didn't understand or somebody losing their books um, another cause is the mistake is from another narrator and the person is not attentive to the mistake or what has been changed either in the chain of narration or the text so he narrates it the same way he heard it without being completely attentive and cognizant to the error contained in the narration and this was something that affected some narrators um, one story that we find in the books of Ilal in the books of Su'alat questions is what al-Bardai 
who was a student of Abu Zur al-Razi, he mentioned in his book, As-Sualat. He said that the hadith that Muhammad ibn Ayyub ibn Suwayd al-Ramli narrated from his father, from al-Awza'i. He said, you mean the hadith Burikli ummati fi bukuriha? You mean the hadith my ummah is blessed in the early parts of the morning? He replied, yes. He said, this hadith is invented. Then he went on to say, I was in a ramla and I saw a sheikh sitting in the corner. Whenever I would look at him, then he would make tasbih. And if I didn't look at him, he would remain silent. I said to myself, this sheikh is trying to trick me or deceive me. So I asked about him. And then they said it was Muhammad ibn Ayyub ibn Suwayd. Then I said to one of my contemporaries, let's go and meet him. So we reached him and he took out his father's books, which were arranged in different categories, handwritten by Ayyub ibn Suwayd. But the chapter headings were left blank. And there were a hadith written with someone else's handwriting in those spaces, different than the handwriting of Ayyub. SubhanAllah, you see how the scholars were so diqiq. They had diqqa, they had preciseness. Even they could distinguish between the different types of handwriting. So I started reading the book and found that the hadith that were written with the first handwriting were authentic. And the hadith that were written with the other handwriting were fabricated and were not from the narrations of Ayyub ibn Suwayd. So I asked him, whose handwriting is this? He said, my father's. Then I asked him about the second handwriting, and he said, it's my handwriting. So I said to him, where did you find these narrations that you wrote with your handwriting? He said, I extracted them from my father's books. Then he, he said, no problem. Bring your father's books that you extracted the hadith from. Then Abu Zura said, then his face became red and angry and upset, and he didn't move at all. Then he said, the books are in Beit al maqdis So then I said, no problem. I'll pay for a caravan to go and bring them for us. I'll write to the ones whom your father's books are with. They'll get them and bring them to us. He remained silent without any answer at all. Then I said to him, woe to you. Don't you fear Allah? And I kept talking to him like this, and he was not able to respond. So most likely he wrote those a hadith from himself or he fabricated some of those hadith because when they were with him and they said that, well, we'll pay for for these books. If they're in Beit al-Maqdis, we'll pay for a caravan to come and bring them. But he never replied. He never had a response. And they understood that he was being dishonest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So that's... Um, Ibn Hibban, he mentioned something similar about um, Abdullah ibn Salih, who was Laith ibn Sa'ad's scribe. Laith ibn Sa'ad, he was one of the great imams from Misr, from Egypt. And <clears throat> he goes on to say, he says, I heard Ibn Khuzayma say, that him and his neighbor were not on good terms and there was enmity between them. So he used to add hadith to his books and write them with the very same handwriting as Abdullah ibn Saleh and would place them in his library amongst his books and parchments. Then Abdullah would pick them up and narrate them thinking they were his sheikh's hadith. And from this aspect, there were some narrations that were not accepted from him. So those were some examples of those who would add narrations to books or add extra wordings which are not from the original author of the book or not from the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Another category of this is when the narrator heard the hadith from his sheikh along with another weak narrator. So two narrators heard the hadith from the sheikh. One is a strong narrator, one is a weak narrator. Shu'ba said to Abi Awana, your book is good, but your memory is worthless. Who did you study with? He said, Mundur al-Sayrafi. Shu'ba said, Mundur is the one who caused this. Okay, So his book is good. Why? Because his book was compared with 
the narrations of his teacher. Okay? But his memory, he heard things from Mundar Asirafi, which were in contradiction to his his book. His book was Diqqa. His book was authentic. His book was accurate. But his memory was weak because he heard those narrations from Mundar Asirafi. Another example is those who erred because of the way they heard other students recite to their sheikh. Mm-hmm. Abbas Adduri, he said in his tarikh, he said a narrator by the name of Habib, who was in Egypt, used to read a hadith to Malik ibn Anas and skip pages and recite quickly. I heard Yahya ibn Ma'in say, they asked me about him in Egypt, so I said, he's worthless. Then Yahya said, Ibn Mukair heard from Malik and heard his hadith from what Habib used to recite to Malik, which is the worst one. Another example or another category from this category is when the teacher or sheikh's dictation is not clear. It's not precise or it's too fast or no good at all. Such as the case with Ibrahim ibn Bashar al-Ramadi, who used to dictate to his students the narrations he heard from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, but with extra wordings and alterations. So much so that Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmad, he said in his ilal, he said, I heard my father mention Ibrahim ibn Bashar al-Ramadi, and he said, he attends the gatherings of Sufyan ibn Uyayna with us, and he used to dictate to the people what he heard from Sufyan. And sometimes he would dictate to them things that they wouldn't hear or catch, as though he would change some of the words in the hadith. Then my father said, I told him one day, don't you fear Allah? You recite to people that which they cannot hear. My father dispraised him greatly for that. End of quote. And that brings us to another um, topic, which is related to this category as well. When a scholar delegates someone to write down what he is narrating or dictating, then the scribe makes a mistake in what he writes, and the scholar doesn't recognize the mistake. So that's another important thing that the student hadith needs to pay attention to. And lastly, related to this category, is when someone was prompted to narrate something that wasn't from his hadith. So we find that many of the scholars of the past Many of them would abandon and avoid some of the narrations of those who either read too fast or taught in a way which the students could not understand what the sheikh, what the scholar was reciting or what he was saying, or they might have been reciting too fast. Okay, And many times the students cannot keep up with a teacher or sheikh who is reciting in that type of manner. And the next cause we'd like to discuss, and we talked about this previously, is when the lone narrator whose memory is weak uses a chain of narration that is popularly used because it is easy to recite and so common. But the stronger, more precise narrators narrate using a chain different than him. And this is called Saluk Ajadda or Lazima at Okay, and we gave many examples for this in some of our previous talks. Seventh cause that is a cause of hidden defects is that the narrator could depend solely upon his book. And sometimes he could narrate from what he had memorized and make mistakes. So different situations for different narrators. And some of the most important reasons that could cause a narrator to narrate from his memory instead of narrating and reading from his books or or, or the opposite, right? Um, so some of the narrators would prefer to narrate from memory instead of reading from their books, is that some narrators could be on a journey and they wouldn't take their books with them. And they would only narrate from memory and sometimes make mistakes. Um, as what occurred with Hisham ibn Urwa when he narrated hadith in Iraq from his memory. 
that were denounced. Or Ma'mar ibn Rashid, we talked about him in some of our previous discussions. When he would go to Basra to visit his mother, his books were not with him. So he would narrate from his memory and sometimes make more mistakes. And this is why the narrations from the people of Basra, from Ma'mar ibn Rashid, have some mistakes in them. Uh, another cause is some would misplace their books or they would be caught on fire or wet or termites would eat them as what happened to one of the narrators, Abdullah ibn Lahia or Lahia and Ismail ibn Ayyash and others. Yahya ibn Ma'in, he said about Ismail, he says, as for his narrations from the people of Hijaz, then his book was misplaced. So what he memorized from them was mixed up. Or also a narrator's high level of confidence in his memory. And occasionally our memories let us down. And occasionally the great scholars of the past, their memories let them down sometimes and sometimes could deceive someone thinking that my memory is so good. But when Allah wills, he causes people to forget so we hope today's lecture was beneficial i know it was a little bit technical but we need to convey this knowledge to our young students of hadith to our students of knowledge so that it can be passed on so that inshallah there will be from amongst you all a few who will be able to master the sciences of hadith and master the techniques and principles to be able to discover, recognize hidden defects in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So we thank all of you for joining us in our hadith discussion today. And until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.